Hey guys, what is going on? Welcome back to my channel. Today's video is gonna address that big question, are saturated fats bad for us? So this video is part of my fat metabolism slash how you lose fat series. This is video number three in the series. So in the previous videos, I touched directly on fat metabolism in the realm of your dietary fat intake, aka the fats that you eat, as well as your ability to metabolize or burn body fat, which I touched on that as adipose tissue. Here it is. I also touched on dietary fats roles inside of your body as well as their function. And at the end of the second video, we ended on a big question, which I had mentioned. Are saturated fats bad for us? So today I'm gonna dive through two different studies to help guide my discussion. I also wanna note that I've included relevant studies to provide brand new insight into the space. Um, I know previous literature has been discussed on YouTube, and I just wanna bring to light some new vibrant insight, not only in the field, but also about these topics, and hopefully my perspective can offer some additional insight into what has already been discussed. So now that we already have an understanding of what dietary fats are, as well as your body fat, I really wanna get into this video and help you guys answer this big question. And again, that question is, are saturated fats bad for us? Let's look at two different papers. So the first paper I'm gonna be talking about is a comparative research study. The title of this video is Saturated Fats Compared with Unsaturated Fats and Sources of Carbohydrates in Relation to Coronary Heart Disease, dash, a prospective cohort study. So I'm gonna take you guys into my poster here. Hopefully you can read it, but if not, I'll just provide some additional insight. So follow my finger as I talk. Um, so the first study, N is sample size. So we were at, we were looking at 127, 590 healthy individuals. Now, this is a comparative study. So that what that means is no actual data was taken on these people. Nobody was pinched, nobody was touched. Um, basically what happened is they were given an FFQ. So an FFQ is a food frequency questionnaire. And the duration of this study in total was 24 to 30 years of data. Now think about that, that's quite a bit of time. And how this worked is these individuals who volunteered for this study were sent an FFQ investigating their dietary saturated versus unsaturated fat intake um, I want to also note that the study did include questions about carbohydrates, but for the purpose of this video, I'm going to be just talking about fats. Now, every four years, they were sent this FFQ, and what we found was really quite interesting. So what the study really found was that replacing saturated fats with unsaturated fats, specifically polyunsaturated fats, can reduce the risk of coronary heart disease. Now I want to offer some perspective. I do want to provide some insight, not only from a scientist perspective, but just an overall perspective of when we read scientific literature. The first thing is first, is I want to note that we should respect everybody taking the time to do scientific research, investigation, because again guys, 24 to 30 years of these people's lives were spent trying to collect this data to provide some insight for us um, in the how section for applicable side of this video. So first and foremost, an analysis of a research paper is not emotional. We are just analyzing the data for the data and what it is. And when we try to connect science with a how for an applicable standpoint to the public, I want you guys to understand and know that these recommendations are not emotionally based. This is solely based on a is what it is type of recommendation, you know? So we, we as scientists and people that are going to read and interpret science should have the utmost respect for the people doing the research um, as well. So 
Now that I've said that, I wanna get into my interpretation um, of this research paper. So when we talk about a comparative study and we see these types of results in relation to coronary heart disease, um, when we think about what a saturated fat is, it's typically found in highly processed food. And that goes far beyond just the donuts, the cookies, the cakes. Um, this can be considered white bread, honey nut Cheerios, um, anything with a long list of ingredients can typically be questioned as a processed thing. And so again, if you guys forgot what an unsaturated fat is, please go back to my last video as I explain everything in light of this discussion. All this study was saying, simply choosing an unsaturated fat versus an unsaturated fat um, would typically be a better option for this population. Um, these are people who do not tr track macros that we know of. These are people that are normal, just living their lives. Um, and typically just healthy. Like we don't know if they resistance train or not. And so when I say it depends on a lot of the things that I recommend, because it truly depends. Um, so in terms of coronary heart disease, a lot of the studies have been done on elderly population. For the elderly population, so you have to sit as the individual and you have to think, who am I, number one, and what how can this help me as the individual, right? So you have to really analyze these, this data for what the data is. And the data is really, really good data based on the inclusion criteria, you know? So you really need to dive in deep and, and look at these um, more than just the, what are we doing and what's the conclusion? Because there's a lot of insight that we can learn by looking deeper um, into these papers. So for the conclusion on this paper, we concluded based on this study um, that just naturally choosing unsaturated fats over saturated fats uh, would be a good idea. On to the next study. So the second study is a landmark study, a randomized control trial, and it was published in 2019. So this is very new data to the scientific community and I wanna break it down in a way that's really, really easy for you guys to Im interpret, understand, and what it can tell us as the individual. This is an actual like abstract picture from the study um, and I want you guys to pay attention to this and I'll link it in the comments below when you look at this study uh, for what I'm talking about. So let's dive in a little bit deeper here. So how many people was this study um, looking at? 20 inpatient individuals. So that means, what inpatient means is they were hospitalized. Um, they were in, in a hospital setting, a randomized control trial, and ad libitum, all that means, you can relate this to the intuitive eating, almost like the intuitive eating type approach in terms of freely grazing, you know, eating as they please. And the duration of this study was two weeks, uh, 14 days. So between the two groups, we had an ad libitum group that was made available um, highly processed foods versus an ad libitum group um, who had the option to choose not highly processed foods. Something else I really wanna mention about this study is that total caloric intake of their diets was equated for. So that is huge. When looking at scientific literature in the realm of the weight loss, uh, weight gain space, really, really big deal if um, calories or total daily macronutrients were equated for. So that's really, really good. What they found was the people who were eating a bunch of processed food um, actually intuitively intook 500 more calories per day compared to this, the other group who was not um, consuming ultra processed foods. And it was really, really interesting because when we look into the type of food that these people were, get, were given, it's more than just the chips the ice cream, the donuts that we think about as ultra processed. It was things like Honey Nut Cheerios, white bread, juices, yogurts with added sugar, even like frozen sausages and like meat products were like over consumed. And those things are ultra processed. How can these studies and information actually be applied to you? First of all, I wanna to touch on the point that what is going to determine whether you gain weight or not, one factor is your
calories in versus your calories out. And I said only one factor because there is a variety of different factors that go into this. You can think about this as total daily energy expenditure and then how much you're taking in. Um, so you can think of this as like a balance, right? So like if you're eating a ton of food and that contains a lot of, a lot of calories, but you're not burning as much through activity, through movement, maybe you're setting all day. What's going to happen? Let's, let's say this is weight gain and this is weight loss. If you're eating more than what you're doing, you're going to gain weight. If you're eating less than what you're doing, you're going to lose weight. Hypothetically, based on just that information alone. And as I said, there's a lieu of, of factors that go into somebody's ability to gain weight or lose weight, but I am just talking about total daily energy expenditure versus how much you eat. So how can this actually help you? Step number one, I'm gonna need you to identify what foods that you're eating. Are you eating a diet high in saturated fats, high in carbs, high in unsaturated fats? You need to be able to identify the foods that you eat as saturated versus unsaturated, if that makes sense. My previous videos can help you uh, with that as well, and they're linked below. Um, I've explained all of this. Now, second question. If you're not tracking your total caloric intake, are you overconsuming these types of foods? And I also want you to pay attention to eating dietary fats and how it makes you feel, right? If you're eating a tablespoon of coconut oil or let's say a bag of chips, which contains fats, typically a lot of saturated fats, and again, saturated fats in the chips. Saturated fats are in chips, and coconut oil is a type of saturated fat, but it's gonna make you feel differently. So I want you to pay attention to that. Number three, who are you? Are you a runner? Are you a lifter? Are you an athlete? Are you sitting in a chair all day? Um, that's really gonna determine the advice that I would give you um, on an individual basis for your dietary intake. I want you guys to think about the sample size and the population in which we're studying because that's all going to play a role in how we can interpret data. Step number four, you can use fats as a tool to really predetermine how you're going to feel, how you're going to think, and how you're going to perform. But that is advanced nutrient timing. That's nutrient timing to the next level. That is more than just should you eat a fat? Should you eat a carb? It's, should I eat fats? When should I eat them? What type of fat? How much? Now that's advanced nutrient timing. So if you want to be on the next level besides just um, understanding nutrient timing, if you already do, that would be the next level. So thank you guys so much for tuning into this video. I hope it was really helpful. And again, I just want to say that 100% from a scientist's perspective, 100% respect these scientists um, that have taken the time to spend years on collecting this data, analyzing this data, because this is, that is real, that is science, you know? So when we want to interpret science and make it applicable to you guys, you know, it's really important to understand that this is science, this is not emotional, this is data, and data can be used to help you on an individual basis if you know how to read the data. So be sure to subscribe if you like this kind of information, you're really liking the way I'm breaking down the science. Um, and if this has helped you, or if you have any additional questions at all, please put them in the comments box. I'm recording two videos every single week and I look at everybody's comments. I comment back to everybody. So please um, spend your time, ask a question because there's a very, very good chance that I will take the time to answer the question either in the comments or in my next YouTube video. The next video is gonna be diving deeper into this process you see right over here on the screen um, called lipolysis. And if you guys forgot, that was step one of the fat loss process. So we're gonna be going into full details on the three major steps um, over the course of the next three videos. So if you haven't watched the other videos already, be sure to refresh your mind before you take the time to watch this. Because again, everything that I teach or I discuss, um, if you guys are not watching these videos three to four times, taking notes, uh, you're, truthfully, you're really not going to be learning anything. You're just going to be hearing me give you advice. And to only hear the advice once, you're gonna need to watch the videos three times again and then trust one person. Um, so yeah, 
So thank you guys so much for tuning into this video. Um, thank you guys for respecting the science, and I look forward to seeing your guys in the com seeing your guys' insight in the comments box below. Um, so with that being said, thank you guys so much for tuning in, and I look forward to seeing you guys in the next video.